like to invite you to turn to our GPS, our Grow, Pray, Study guide in the back of the worship bulletin. You'll see there's a, a section there for taking notes, and I really believe that God speaks to each of us personally uh, in a way that I don't even fully understand. And if there's something that God is saying to you, something you want to remember from today's message, I invite you to do so with this uh, area here for notes. Below that is the study guide, which is an invitation for you to read the Bible each day this week with scripture passages that tie into today's message. So I invite you to take and to use the GPS this week. As we've said earlier, today is the first Sunday of Advent. And Advent is the season of four Sundays, four weeks leading up to Christmas. Now the word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming. So in Advent, we look forward to Christ's coming. In Advent, we prepare ourselves for Christ's coming. In Advent, we cry out for Christ's coming. We sang, as we did earlier this morning, Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. Advent is a time of waiting. Waiting on God's promises. And that's the theme of this year's Advent series, the promise of Christmas. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, Paul writes something interesting. He says this, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Paul is saying that all of God's promises are fulfilled in Christ. In the birth of Jesus, we hear a resounding yes to all of God's many promises. So what exactly does God promise us in the birth of Jesus Christ? A new sweater, a stress-free life, well-behaved kids, well, that's the question that we are going to explore over the next four weeks. What does God promise us in Christmas? And we're going to do so beginning this morning by looking at the promise of hope. The promise of Christmas is first and foremost a promise of hope. It's a promise, in the words of Isaiah 61, to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to comfort all who mourn, to replace our spirit of despair with a garment of praise. Now, Isaiah is speaking to people who've experienced darkness and despair, two words that show up in Isaiah 61. People who've experienced darkness and despair in the world around them, and people who've experienced darkness and despair in their own hearts. And I want to address both of these by first looking at the darkness around us. Now, Isaiah lived in Jerusalem in 740 BC. And at this time, the Israelites were divided into two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And the Assyrians attacked and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, we don't talk a lot about the Assyrians today, but they were in power for 1,900 years. They were a major military might. What, what's interesting is that their empire existed in what is today modern-day Iraq and Syria. And they destroyed Israel. Now, later on, the Babylonians came, and they destroyed Israel conquered and destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah. That's the context that Isaiah is writing in. So Isaiah is writing to a country and to people who are in the midst of a lot of uncertainty and fear. Uncertainty and fear about world events going, around, going on around them and certainly a lot of fear about what's going on in their own country and its future. And I think some of us can relate. 
We look at what's going on with ISIS and the, the rise of terrorist attacks across the globe. We look at what's going on in, in Syria and, and there's the wave of refugees across the globe. And we look at what's going on in our own country and for some people, maybe for many people, the outlook is bleak. Regardless of your political perspective, I think we can all agree that this election tapped into fear about our country's future and fear about what's going on in the world. There is an uneasiness. For some, maybe even a spirit of despair, which is how Isaiah describes it. When we look at just where as a world we are headed. Now Isaiah spoke into this same sense of uncertainty, into the same sense of darkness, and he promised that a light would come. In particular, through Isaiah, God promised that he would send his chosen servant, that he would send his Messiah. And Isaiah 61, today's scripture, is a promise that describes in detail what the Messiah would do. Now, what's interesting is that Jesus Christ fulfills this promise. In fact, in, in Luke's gospel, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, the first thing he does is read this passage from Isaiah 61. And then he turns to the people around him and he says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus came to fulfill what is promised in Isaiah 61, to bring light into the darkness, to comfort all who mourn, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Now, we live in a crazy world, don't we? We live in a world where so much is changing. You know, what will the future look like? No one knows, right? Next year is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And we're in that same kind of framework where everything changed around the Reformation and the Renaissance. 500 years later, we're in that same period where with changes, technology, all the different changes going on, no one knows what the future will look like. And that can create fear instead of hope. But Isaiah speaks hope to us. Isaiah reminds us, even when the world is changing drastically, even when things may, from your perspective, look bleak as far as just culturally or economically or, or where things are in the world around us, God is still present, and God still has the last word. Earlier in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 9, God tells us that his Messiah will reign forever and ever. The future belongs to God's Messiah, not to the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Greeks or the Egyptians or the Romans. See, God's people lived under all of these empires from the time of Isaiah to the time of Jesus. But each and every one of these empires eventually fell. And while living under each of them, God's people turned to the words of Isaiah and remembered this isn't the end of the story. There is one who is coming, God's chosen Messiah. He will bring light into our dark world. In fact, he is the light of the world. And in him, there is hope for all of us, hope for our country and hope for the world. Now, in him, there is also hope for each and every one of us on a very personal level. Darkness doesn't just exist in the world around us. And there's a lot of dark things in the world. But we know that darkness can also exist in our own hearts. And in the birth of Jesus, God promises us hope for our lives. Isaiah speaks of a spirit of despair. And I think we can certainly see that in our day. I remember in June seeing a, a front page 
article in the newspaper on this biannual study on the health risk behaviors of students in Hawaii. It's a major study. And there was one category in the study that really caught my attention. This is a study of high school students in Hawaii. According to this study, 30% of high school students in our state reported feeling sad or hopeless almost every day for two or more weeks, at least once in their lifetime. 30%. But then this is the statistic that really jumped out at me. 11% had attempted suicide in the past 12 months. 11, one out of every 10 high school student in Hawaii has not just thought about suicide, but has attempted suicide. One out of every 10. I find that just a staggering statistic. I mean, if we wonder why it's important to have a, a strong, vital youth ministry, say no more. There are a lot of youth in our state that are looking for hope. And that may be the, the most extreme form, those who are, who are thinking, acting in a suicidal manner. But if we come back, even in a less extreme form, how many of us at different points in our life may struggle with depression? You know, I, when I think about depression in its various forms, and I know there can be severe clinical depression, but there can also be mild depression. My guess is that every single family here has a family member, if we go out to our extended family, that has dealt with, that has struggled with depression. It affects so many of us. But if we kind of come back even from that, how many of us experience times of being discouraged? How many of us experience discouragement in our hearts? And, and I know for me, that's a very relevant topic because I do feel like I've, I've been discouraged lately. And uh, I had this image that came to my mind where you know you got like your gas tank or the different, uh, on your car you've got how hot your engine is, you know. And I was thinking if we've got that thing and like, you know, here's empty and here's full. And I was thinking, you know, on that gauge of my life, if you've got encouraged over here and discouraged over here, I was thinking when my heart is in idle, it's idling in discouragement. And that was just the image that I felt described some of what I've been struggling with lately. And I know that God wants to speak hope into my life and God wants to speak hope into all of our lives. Now, what does that mean exactly? What is hope? Well, I like how Pastor Matt Woodley defines hope. He defines it this way. Hope is a vision for better days that changes us in the present. Hope is a vision for better days that changes us in the present. Hope is a vision for better days. Hope says there's something up ahead, around the corner, something in sight that is good. We see this aspect of hope throughout Scripture. Time and time again, God says the days are coming. The days are coming when this will happen. The days are coming when I will do this. All throughout the Old Testament, God says the same thing. Better days are coming. You know, it's interesting because discouragement, hopelessness, doesn't just look at our present circumstances and say, you know, things are tough. Things are tough. No. Discouragement, hopelessness, looks at the future and says, things aren't going to get good. Things aren't going to change. Things aren't going to get better. It's always future-oriented. And throughout the Old Testament, God says, better days are coming, and these better days are coming because the Messiah is coming. The vision for a better future in Scripture isn't based on wishful thinking or even in our faith in the future. Instead, it's a promise that points to a specific person. Hope is not wrapped up in a season or in a program or in a new job or a better spouse or a bigger house. Hope is wrapped up in a person and the biblical name for that person is the Messiah. See, the promise of Christmas is that in Jesus Christ we have a good future. 
Even if we lose our job in Jesus Christ, we have a good future. Even if we get sick in Jesus Christ, we have a good future. Even if we die in Jesus Christ, we have a good future. That is the hope of Christmas. And that hope sustains us. There's a song that has been playing on Christian radio stations for quite a while now. It's a song by an artist named Hilary Scott. It's a song called Thy Will. And I'm not familiar with, this, with her as an artist. I think she's a country artist by background. But um, this is a song that she wrote in a dark period in her life. This is a song that she wrote after having a, uh, a miscarriage. And so it's a time when she's struggling with that. But there's a simple refrain in the song. And rather than just saying it, I thought that uh, Barb and I would sing it. And I just want to invite you to sing it with us if you would like to. We're going to sing it a few times. And just sing this, listen to this as a prayer, as a way that this song speaks of hope, even for someone in the midst of a very dark period in their life. I know you see me. I know you hear me, Lord. Your plans are for me. Goodness you have in store. I know you see me. I know you hear me, Lord. Your plans are for me. Goodness you have in store. I know you see me. I know you hear me, Lord. Your plans are for me. Goodness you have in store. Goodness you have in store. That's what hope declares. Hope is a vision for better days. But it doesn't just end there. Hope is a, a vision for better days that changes us in the present. See, God's good future isn't just abstract because it, it reaches in and transforms us in the present. That's how, how hope works, right? Think about a high school student who has never thought that they could go to college. And yet there's that one teacher who gives them hope. You can go to college. What does that do? That hope reaches in and transforms their present. That hope motivates them to start studying harder. That hope motivates them to actually fill out some applications. That hope motivates them to visit some colleges. The hope reaches in and transforms their present. Or think of someone who's just feeling stuck in a really unhappy marriage. And then through some way, they receive hope that says, my marriage can get better. See, that hope then transforms them in the present. That hope then motivates them and says, hey, let's have a date night. <laughs> Would you be willing to go with me to a therapist? That hope actually motivates them in the present to make changes in their lives. Or think of someone who's struggling with an addiction just the hopelessness that that can be and where that hopelessness drives them. And yet when there is hope, that hope reaches in and transforms their present. That hope says, I'm going to go to a 12-step program. That hope says, I'm going to reach out to friends. I'm not going to isolate myself. I'm going to take positive steps. I'm going to get the help I need. Hope reaches in and transforms us in the present. Or think of someone who just looks out at the world and all of the darkness in the world, and there is so much. And maybe just feels hopeless. Like, God, there are people dying just of food, people dying who don't have, even have water to drink. And yet that hope says, we can do something about that. We can do something about people who don't have clean drinking water. That hope motivates people who started Charity Water, which is the group through which we gave money. And last week, we saw those water wells in Ethiopia. It's hope that comes in our present and transforms us. 
Martin Luther, the great reformer, once said, everything that is done in the world is done by hope. Everything that is done in the world is done by hope. Hope provides us with a vision of God's future which empowers us to act today. Hope gives us a vision of God's future which enables us to take risks today. It moves us out. It empowers us to live. And God wants to give each and every one of us the gift of hope this Christmas. Now, God, in fact, already gave me this gift. I think it was an early Christmas present, really one of the best presents I think I could have possibly received. And he did so through my wife, Cindy. On Monday night, I was watching TV, and Cindy came out. So what are you doing? I'm watching TV. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you. Okay, I'll give up. I don't know what it was, probably some sport event or MacGyver or The Voice or something. I don't know. I was doing something important, right, watching TV. She said, I want to talk to you. Sit down next to me on the little couch we have in, in her office. She said, I'm worried about you. And I want to pray for you. And I want to pray for you every Monday night and Wednesday night. And so we sat for a while. And she just talked to me about what was going on. And then she prayed for me. And I got to say, as a spouse, if you want to give your spouse a gift of hope, take the risk of praying for them. She prayed for me this, what I just... It was a powerful prayer. I don't know how else to describe it. And just in our conversation, we were together for maybe an hour. But in that conversation and in that prayer was just a reminder of God's call on my life. A reminder of God's call on our life as a married couple. A reminder of God's work here in Hawaii. A reminder of that the future belongs to God and it is good in God. And it was just that prayer time just kind of cleared out some of these, these cobwebs that were in my mind. And I really just felt like God breathed his hope into me through that prayer time. And I really just am so thankful for Cindy. She came to me on Wednesday night and she said, we're doing it again, come here. I'm praying for you. Her words, that prayer, that time with God breathed hope into my life. And God wants to breathe his hope into our lives this morning. God wants to give us the gift of hope. Let's pray. I just want to invite you, if you're comfortable doing so, putting your hands out forward, your palms up, and invite you just in your own way, just invite God to breathe hope into you. Maybe there's something going on in your family that's tough right now. Maybe there's a situation at work. Maybe you're looking forward and you're just not seeing a path ahead. It's just, it's looking dark. It's looking discouraging. Just give that issue, give that area to God and just ask God to fill you with hope. God, we live in a world where there are a lot of hope busters. There are a lot of things that can be discouraging. Things going on with our kids, things going on in our own marriage, things going on at work, things going on internally, things going on externally. God, we acknowledge that there are these hope busters and we give them to you, and we ask you to fill our hearts with your hope. Would you remind us through the power of your Holy Spirit that you are good and that you have plans for us, that you have goodness in store for us? Would you remind us this morning that you see us and that you hear us, Lord? We receive your gift of hope. 
And as we do, God, we want to pray for our church family. We want to pray for Keith, who is critically ill in Kona. We want to pray for Joyce's sister, Chris, who's going to the doctor today. God, we're praying that she would receive good news. We want to pray for traveling mercies for all those who are traveling. And God, we want to pray for our president-elect. We pray for President-elect Trump and just ask that you would be at work in his life, guiding him. We pray for all of our leaders and um, all that is going on just politically in our state and in our nation and in the world. God, we believe that you are the God of hope and that you do have good things in store for our world. Help us to choose into your ways and into your life. I want to invite us to close this message time by praying an Advent prayer. And the words of this prayer are going to be on the screen. This is a prayer that was written by a pastor named Frederick Buechner. And it is an Advent prayer. For me, it is a prayer that invites us to experience God's hope as we wait as we prepare ourselves, as we cry out for Jesus to come, let us pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus Christ, thou Son of the Most High, Prince of Peace, be born again into our world. Wherever there is war in this world, wherever there is pain, wherever there is loneliness, Wherever there is no hope, come, thou long-expected one, with healing in thy wings. Holy child, whom the shepherds and the kings and the dumb beasts adored, be born again. Wherever there is boredom, wherever there is fear of failure, wherever there is temptation too strong to resist, wherever there is bitterness of heart, Come, thou blessed one, with healing in thy wings. Savior, be born in each of us as we raise our faces to your face, not knowing fully who you are, knowing only that your love is beyond our knowing and that no other has the power to make us whole. Come, Lord Jesus, to each who longs for you. Come quickly. Amen.